um, it's a great honor to uh, invite Ikram Hussein uh, to present his uh, keynote presentation. Um, Ikram Hussein is a professor at the University of Manitoba and he's a member of the College of the Royal Society of Canada and the Fellow of the Canadian Academy of Engineering at the Fellow of the Engineering Institute of Canada. Hussein current research interest uh, includes uh, design analysis and optimization of wireless communication networks and applied machine game theory and network economics. Uh, he was elevated to an uh, AAA fellow uh, for contributions to spectrum management and resource allocation to cognitive cellular radio uh, networks. Uh, Hussein has won several research awards, including those from the uh, communication a communication society concert. Um, currently, he serves as an editor of the HRP Transactions on Mobile Computing and the director for online content for the uh, HRP e Comsoc. Yeah, bye. Professor. Thank you, Ethan, for your. Uh generous introduction. I hope uh, you folks can hear me, right? Thank you. Um, so good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you for attending this talk today. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Elias. Sorry. It's okay. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so I'd like to thank uh, Elias. Sharif and Yufen for inviting me to give this talk. Um, and I'm so glad to see many of my friends here. Uh, it's really nice after quite a bit of time since you know we went to pandemic and things were uh, only online. So it's really a pleasure to see you folks and to be able to give this presentation. And also I was inspired by Damla's comments uh, to join TCCC. Uh, I think I'm going to join today actually. So thank you, Damla. Okay, so uh, the talk is on uh, multi-arm bandit models. Uh, if you are familiar, uh, this is basically a type of machine learning model um, that can be used for many uh, distributed decision-making and control problems. So if you want to model uh, some distributed decision-making problem, I mean, this is a tool that uh, you can use actually. So more specifically, this is a type of reinforcement learning tool actually. So I'm going to uh, give you kind of an introduction uh, to these multi-arm bandit models. Uh, and I wanted to keep the talk more of a tutorial kind so that you know um, it's, it's kind of more accessible to uh, all of you uh, who might have different backgrounds. Okay, so here is the outline. I will start off with uh, an introduction to these multi-arm bandit models. And uh, I will talk about some of the basic MAB algorithms. Um, and then you know, uh, I will go to kind of a more sophisticated MAB models, a model where we talk about uh, uh, some global constraints uh, you know, um, and bring them into the model. Uh, to make them kind of more practical. Uh, and in this context, I will show how this bandwidth model uh, with global constraints, which is also called like a bandwidth with knapsack, can be used in many distributed control and decision-making problems, including the one that I put in the title, for example, in the context of mobile edge computing. Uh, and I'm going to show you some numerical results on, uh, you know, on this uh, MAB with knapsack model uh, when we applied this edge computing problem. Um, if we have time, then I will move to the next uh, topic, which is uh, contextual bandwidth. So going a little bit, you know, uh, to a higher level even where we can make the MAB model even a bit more sophisticated. Um, so. Sharif, please alert me you know, a few minutes before I need to stop so I know whether I can uh, touch on the last topic. Okay, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, 
distributed decision making will be important for many of uh, communications and networking problems, uh, like in IoT type of problems, due to the scalability of the uh, system, right? If you want to make a system scalable, uh, we need to be able to make distributed decisions. I mean, sometimes, you know, uh, it becomes very difficult to have everything uh, centralized, right? So uh, you want to make systems scalable, you need distributed uh, solutions. Uh, here are a few examples. Uh, for example, um, if you think of a channel access problem in a wireless network, right? So each node well, should be able to access uh, the channel independently maybe without any coordination. Of course, uh, it should uh, be an efficient access method. So uh, it, these are distributed decision problems. Also say, for example, base station association. So if you have a geographical area where you've got a lot of base stations and access points where a device can connect to, so you may need to make a decision on which access point it should be associated with, right? Power control problems can be also distributed, right? Each device can make a decision on how much power to transmit, et cetera. And uh, in the context of edge computing, for example, uh, a device may need to make a decision by itself whether to offload or not, or how much to offload, and also to which server to offload, right? Now, for distributed decision making, data-driven uh, techniques, like machine learning techniques will be suitable, and this is, basically where these multi arm bended models can help. Okay, so uh, MAB models are basically some sort of reinforcement learning models uh, which are studied in machine learning. Uh, now the name of comes from uh, basically the slot machines in casino. That's where this bending comes from. So uh, it's like if you want to play in a casino, like you uh, go to a slot machine and pull arms, right? Now, you may lose, you may win, right? So, because you may lose your money, right? So that's where this term bending comes from. So uh, a machine can have three arms. So basically, you try to pull the best arm, you know, uh, hoping that you will earn some rewards, right? So the gambler's intention is to basically earn as much as possible. So it's like a sequential uh, decision-making problem. You play for a number of time slots, right? And over this whole time horizon, you want to maximize your, your profit. So each time uh, you pull an arm, or basically you make a decision, Sorry, you get an award. Just, just for an hour, five minutes. So every time the decision maker makes a decision and you are using it, right? So you uh, transmit the channel, transmit, right? And your transmission to the system, or you can use, uh, right? So if you use success, you get it work, you know, it's the same you get a negative right? Uh, so over successive stages, right? Uh, over successive time intervals, right? Uh, you you accumulate some reward, and your intention is to maximize this reward, right? uh, the long-term uh, average reward. Now, the beauty of these models is you can do some analysis. Uh, you might be able to find some kind of bound on the performance of this algorithm. Uh, and this is in contrast to many of the machine learning models where we do many analysis, right? So, Compared to other machine learning models, this is a bit more rigorous in that sense uh, because you are able to find some kind of bounds, you know. So uh, you know how far you are from uh, your uh, optimal kind of solution. Now, uh, there are a lot of applications uh, of these energy models, including uh, nuclear trials, simulation systems, and systems. So the algorithm is very simple. So you have got a number of choices, right? And you play over a certain number of times, over the time cycle, right? And each time you play, a reward is given. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, basically, 
is the index of the answer is a priority. And so you say each time uh, you choose an art, uh, you select an action, and uh, the environment will be used uh, any word. And you observe any word, and then with the next sum, you will be able to Okay. Sorry, Rob. Actually, the, that mic is not picking up very well. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. The mic is okay. uh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. The volume is low. You can. Can you check the volume on the left? Thank you. Okay, for now, we'll be right. Okay, okay. So, sorry. Okay, so uh, basically the al algorithm should uh, output a policy given the past uh, history of uh, of the you know of the algorithm. So basically, uh, if you are at stage T, you have the historical information, right? So last action and reverse for the you know uh, last T minus one rounds. So at round T, you basically make a decision based on what you have seen so far, right? So uh, so the algorithm should output the policy based on the historical information. And uh, how do you measure the performance of the algorithm? You will measure what is called the regret, right? So each time you play an arm, you get an award. Now that might not be the optimal award that you could have, right? So you have got K arms to, uh, to uh, you know, play, and you choose an arm, you get an award, a reward. Now you might have played the best arm, right? Which would result in the best reward. So the difference of uh, these two rewards, the best one that you could achieve and the reward that you have got is basically what is called the regret. So over this time horizon, you accumulate uh, you, this regret uh, and your intention is to minimize the regret or in equivalently you want to maximize the rewards. Yeah, so this is what I said. Now, uh, when you do some analysis, you basically deal with the expected value of the regret. Uh, so uh, this uh, e, uh, expected value of the regret is used generally for analysis. Now we'll see when we look at the bounds. So you want to bound the expected amount of regret, right? And as I said, the goal of the algorithm is to minimize regret. Now, there are also some different types of MAB models. So it's just a kind of, a, you know, shows the main types of these multi embedded models. Uh, first of all, uh, it could be a finite time horizon MAB model or an infinite horizon model. Uh, the arms in the model could be uh, independent or there could be some correlation among the arms. So basically the actions that you have uh, to choose from, there could be correlation among some of these actions. Uh, your model may exploit some side information or may not. Like for example, if you're only looking at the reward, past rewards, so basically you do not have any other information, then you can say, okay, I do not have any other side information. The only information I have is the reward from the past uh, rounds, past stages. But uh, you, your model can, incorporate some additional information as we'll see in the case of contextual bandage, for example, it can use other information besides rewards. So those models will be like models with some additional side information. Um, MAB models could be Markovian or they could be stateless. So Markovian model means the state of each of the arm can evolve over time. So the evolution of the uh, states of the arms, they can follow a Markov process. On the contrary, in case of stateless bandits, so basically there is no state associated with, uh, with the arms. Now, uh, again, in case of Markovian bandits, you could have uh, two types actually, uh, frozen bandits, restless bandits. Uh, now, frozen bandits means uh, only some of the arms uh, change their states, not all of the arms. So, Basically, the arm which is chosen in the last round, the state of that arm will change, but the states of the other arms will be frozen. They won't change. So that's what's called uh, frozen bandits. But for restless bandits, 
the states of all of the arms change you know, over the time slot. Now, stateless bandits, uh, basically, as I said, there is no state associated with the arms. Um, now, there are two types, again, uh, like in adversarial bandits and stochastic bandits. So in case of stochastic bandits, the reward is picked up from a distribution. So basically, for each arm, there is a reward distribution. And it each stays, uh, the reward is chosen from the distribution, right? Uh, but for adversarial, there may not be any distribution. Well, anyways, so I'm not going to th those very details, but what I'm all trying to say, there are all sorts of different kinds of these MEB models, and you may be able to choose one of them for your problem, right? So depending on what problem you're dealing with, you might be able to find one, uh, one of the MEB models to work with. Okay, so in this talk, uh, I will uh, basically focus on this uh, stochastic Maldian bandits. Uh, so, as I just mentioned, uh, you have got a finite number of arms, and when you pull an arm, a reward is generated, and that reward follows certain distribution. But remember, the gambler, the player does not have any idea of the distribution, you know, so they, you know, it's basically the, the player has to make a decision kind of a blindly, or you can say based on the past information, but the distribution is actually unknown to the player. So this is just an example. I mean, you could have different distributions, you know, depending on the distribution, you have those parameters, right? As I said, when an arm is pulled, uh, a, a reward is generated following the distribution. Okay. Uh, now, what is the most common sense way of making a decision, you think? You have a number of choices available, right? And you have, played those choices over time and what you do next time. Like you went to several restaurants, right? In the last 12 months, right? Five restaurants. Now tomorrow you have to go to another restaurant. So which one will you go? Of course, the one that you have uh, had the best experience probably so far, right? So that's the most common sense. So here the same thing. So uh, for all the arms, you calculate the, what's called the estimated average reward that you have seen so far. Right? That would be a key information that you're going to exploit to make your next decision. So this new uh, hat A is basically the average reward that you have seen for arm A, for action A, right? Up to time T. Now the next line is basically the same thing, just after some algebra, you can arrive at this expression. So it basically shows that you can update the value incrementally. So after each stage, you can update the value of this empirical mean, uh, empirical mean reward by this, uh, you know, update uh, equation. Okay, so well, you have that information, right? Now, as I said, without any other side information, this is the only information you have, and then based on this, you have to make a decision. Now, this leads to some very simple algorithm, like explore then commit. So this is the same example that I just said. So you look at the mean, values and you choose the action which has the highest mean reward so far. That's exactly what is explored then commit algorithm, most common sense algorithm. Uh, now, the other one, a little bit more uh, sophisticated is epsilon greedy algorithm. Now, if you think carefully, this ETC only exploits the information that you have. It does not explore anything, but the epsilon greedy has an exploration component. So basically you just don't want to be uh, greedy, but you want to explore other choices, right? So you want to check other restaurants. You just don't want to go to the best one so far. Maybe it's worthwhile to check other restaurants, right? Maybe something better may come up, right? So this is exactly what this epsilon greedy does. So you choose the best one with certain probability, but there's also a non-zero probability of choosing something else. This is epsilon greedy. Okay. Now, even going further, uh, you can do it even better. You can combine this exploration, exploitation even more efficiently. And this is exactly what is done in this UCB algorithm, what is called upper confidence bound algorithm. And if you see papers on multi arm bandit, 98% papers basically use this UCB or some variants of UCB. There's the most popular algorithm. And actually, all the variants of MAB somehow exploit this this uh, principle of uh, UCB, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Okay, so 
Now, what UCB does for each action, for each arm, it calculates what is called an upper confidence bound on the reward. And that's actually a summation of the empirical mean reward, the equation that we just saw based on the historical you know, observation, plus a confidence radius. Okay, so you have that information, the mean average reward, but you got to add a kind of a confidence bound, a confidence radius to that mean value. And that will give you the upper confidence bound, right? Now we know uh, how to find the uh, mean reward, but how do you find this confidence radius? Now, just uh, look quickly over this. So this confidence bound is uh, calculated based on this Huebdings inequality. Now, remember we made an assumption. We said all the rewards are generated from some distributions, right? For each arm, we have a distribution. Now, that kind of uh, the basic assumption you have to make here to, you, to be able to use this uh, inequality. So what Huebdings inequality says, you can bound the difference between the mean of a random variable and the sample mean. So you have got a bunch of IID random variables. You take a set of them. You, you find the mean of that sample. Now the difference between the actual mean and that sample mean can be bounded, right? So in this case, I don't know, my uh, pointer does not, Anyway, so, uh, I'm sorry. So, oops. So if you see, basically the difference between the mean, mean of the uh, distribution and the sample mean is upper bounded by e to the power minus t u squared. So it, this is basically intuitive because say you fix the number of samples in that set. For a fixed number of samples, if you increase the value of u, right, the difference between the mean uh, of the distribution and the sample mean, the higher the value of u, the lower will be the probability, right? You know, so the difference, the probability that the difference will be large is small, right? And vice versa. Again, if you fix u, but if you increase the sample size, the difference will be small, right? As you can expect. If you take a large sample set, the average is going to be more close to the actual average. So, you know, it's, it's, it makes sense. So we are going to use this inequality in, in our case, as you can see in this uh, succeeded equation. So basically here the sample mean is the mean reward that we have seen so far and the actual mean of the distribution is mu, mu bar, that's the actual mean. So basically if you play arm A, what is the mean reward that you can expect? And mu hat is the mean reward that you have seen so far, right? So you just directly apply, literally, you know, you apply this inequality and what do you do? For the upper bound, you take a fixed value a constant value for the right hand side and it gives you the value of ua which is the confidence radius now this results in the value of ucb the mean empirical reward plus the confidence radius which is you see on the um, on the right hand side of the last line now you will choose the action which has the highest value of this ucb right so that's kind of common sense now if you look at UCB, as I said, it's kind of intelligently incorporates both exploitation and exploration uh, because you know, the larger the value of mu hat t, the larger is the average reward that you've seen so far, right? So basically you exploit your information. You exploit what you have experienced. And the second term in the denominator, you have got NAT, which is basically the number of times this action A has been chosen. The smaller the value, the higher will be the value of the second term. The smaller the value of Na, the higher the value of the second term, right? So this will make the total value larger. So basically you tend to take a decision, take an action which has not been taken many times so far. 
So the fewer number of times the action has been taken, the larger the value of the bound, the, the radius, right? And this makes the total value larger. So you tend to take that action. So you see, it's a, it, it incorporates both exploitation and exploration. And as I said, this is a very intelligent uh, kind of a method actually. So, so basically, okay, if you want to explain in simple terms. So you have a mean kind of a reward. Now you want to add something. It's kind of a, uh, a safety kind of thing, right? You can think of like a safety and, um, you know, you want to be optimistic in some sense. So basically you add this to the mean, mean reward, right? You say, okay, hopefully I can get another 10 more dollars, you know, for this action. For other action, I can get another $20. So you want to be optimistic, you know, in, the, uh, in some sense, and you choose the action which uh, is the most optimistic. So that's kind of the idea here. Okay, so uh, I will not go through this uh, proof. I mean, these are standard, you know, uh, things. So, but uh, just for your information, uh, this UCB uh, basically uh, the expected regret can be upper bounded by uh, this. So you can say, okay, this is kind of a sublinear. So of course, you've increased the number of stages, number of iterations, the regret will go down, and this is kind of the relationship. So it's like a sublinear with the number of stages, the you know the expected regret. Okay, now this is simple bended model. Uh, now may not be you know very good for many practical problems because for many practical systems and problems, when you make a decision, right, it comes with a cost as well. Like when we transmit, it's not only transmission whether it's successful or failure, but we also spend some energy and, and things like that, right? And we have a budget on this cost, right? We have a limited budget, like could be energy constraint or, or something like that. So it's not only maximizing the reward, but also we have to look at the constraints that you may have, right? So the problem is actually maximizing our utility or maximizing our profit or minimizing regrets subject to some global constraints, right? And these gives rise to bandit models with knapsack. So basically they are enhanced bandit models where you can bring in some constraints as well. So you want to maximize, you want to optimize under some constraints. Okay, so now in the context of this edge computing uh, problem, uh, so you have got multiple servers where you can offload your task from your mobile device. Now you may need to make a decision, right? Which server to choose from, right? Uh, now each server has resource, you know, uh, heterogeneity, you know, different kinds of speeds and things like that. And also offloading uh, may have some cost in terms of energy, et cetera. Uh, so you have to make a choice, right? Uh, and basically you have a budget, you have a cost budget, right? I mean, you know, you have a limited amount of uh, energy, for example, to spend. So basically uh, you can say, just one example here, the reward can be modeled like one or zero. If it is you know, offloaded successfully and you get the result back on a timely manner, then it's, you basically uh, get a reward. Otherwise you don't get a reward. And of course, after each offloading, you have some cost, right? These uh, denoted by the C1 to CD. So basically you've got D types of resources. Could be energy, monetary cost and things like that. So this just to make it general, you have a vector, right, uh, of dimension D, which denotes the cost. Okay. Yeah, so now, as I said, the objective is to minimize the regret or maximize uh, your, you know, uh, profit subject to your budget constraint. Now, if you want to think in terms of optimization, this is actually a stochastic optimization problem, right? So you maximize your expected reward over a finite time horizon subject to your resource constraint. Now, first of all, the agents don't have any idea about these uh, expected rewards because it doesn't know, right? Uh, how much on average an arm would result, right? What kind of reward it would give. So it doesn't have any idea, but for theory, right? For analytical purpose, I mean, you can formulate the problem like this and you can benchmark your algorithm against the true solution that you might be able to get from this. Geniated solution could be generated based on this formulation. Now, if you think, uh, this is actually a combinatorial problem, again, because this is a zero one knapsack problem, actually. 
say a genie knows the expected rewards for all the arms, right? And it knows the expected cost for each arm, right? So if you are familiar with the knapsack problem, this is simply zero one knapsack problem, which you know, this is a combinatorial problem. So even, uh, you know, uh, to be able to solve it by a genie, it has to go through this combinatorial, you know, exhaustive kind of a search process, okay? Now, oh, what you can do? You can relax the problem. So instead of zero one, you can make it a fractional knapsack problem. So if you are familiar with the fractional knapsack problem, so basically what you do, you don't uh, choose a particular action with probability one or zero, but you do with certain probability between zero and one. Well, inclusive zero and one for sure. So it's not binary anymore, but you can take any value between zero and one. So if you relax the problem, then it becomes a fra fractional knapsack problem, which is very easy to solve. So this is kind of a nice thing here that uh, we relax the problem from zero one knapsack, we go to fractional knapsack and this can be solved in a greedy manner. So basically you can come up with a greedy algorithm that can solve the problem optimally. So this is the beauty of uh, this fractional knapsack problem, okay? Now I have an example. Uh, I'm just to quickly go through this fractional knapsack problem. So basically uh, this is the problem formulation. So you have got, uh, maybe I should go to this. Okay, so just to give you a more concrete example, so you have got uh, five items to choose from. Each item has a value and a weight, okay? So these are gold bars, right? So you have one bar with a value of $280 maybe, and it weighs say, 40 grams, just a arbitrary example. So you've got four, four such gold bars, and you get to uh, choose among them, and you have a, a uh, knapsack, which is a capacity of say 60 gram, right? So which ones you would choose? You have a limited capacity knapsack, which you got to uh, fill up with those gold bars, right? So how do you maximize your, your profit? So if you do a zero one knapsack, so basically you will choose the first and third one, okay? And basically you, your total profit is like $400 and you basically use all of your knapsack capacity. Now, if you do a fractional one, so basically you took uh, the first one, the second one, and half of the third one. So this is what the fractional knapsack means. You don't need to take the whole, whole of that you know, element, but you can take part of it, okay? So if you do fractional, you get a profit of $440. It even gives you higher reward. While you still basically, uh, you know, maintain the knapsack capacity, 60. So this is what is the difference between zero one knapsack and fractional knapsack. So the lesson is by relaxing the problem, you can even get higher basically profit. And it's also become solvable by using a greedy algorithm, okay? Now, this is basically very simple algorithm. What you do, the items that you have, you rank them. How? Based on their value divided by weight. So you find this ratio, value divided by weight and you rank all the elements in a descending order of this value versus uh, value over weight ratio, okay? And then you pick, you know, one by one until your knapsack is filled. Very simple, greedy algorithm. And this gives the optimal solution of the fractional knapsack problem. So, so this is beautiful. And the, Complexity is basically n log n because you get to uh, sort them. So the complexity of this algorithm is simply complexity of a sorting algorithm, n log n. So this is actually the basis of uh, the greedy algorithm that I'm going to talk about quickly for this uh, bandwidth with knapsack problem, right? So uh, what do you do? Following the same principle that we have seen for the fractional knapsack problem, the greedy algorithm, so for each server, in our case, this is the action that we're going to take, right? So you've got say 
k servers to choose from. So for each server, we basically calculate that ratio, right? Value over weight, right? That ratio. In this case, this is basically the mean reward divided by mean consumption, okay? Uh, so now if you see in the numerator, you have the reward and in the denominator, you have got the cost, right? Now, see, this is a vector. The cost is a vector, right? Because you've got D resources. So you need another vector to make it scalar. You need the dot product, right? So this new star is basically what is called the fi fictional unit cost. So that's a vector that we get to multiply with the uh, cost vector to get the denominator, okay? And you get a scalar value the bank per buck, right? That's what we call the bank per buck. So for each of the servers, we calculate this uh, ratio. And, and basically, uh, uh, you got the, um, you can rank all the server based on this ratio as we did in a fractional knapsack problem, right? So uh, what you can do, uh, you can apply UCB, right? Uh, so uh, obtain an optimistic estimate uh, of mean reward. And in this case, because we have a cost involved here, what you do, we'll also take care of the cost here. Uh, so we'll combine the profit and the cost. Remember, it's, it's unlike pure UCB, where we only talk about the profit, right? You've got a mean reward and you uh, add a confidence radius. That's it, that's you get the UCB, right? And you choose the action with the highest Value of, uh, value of UCB. But in this case, we have a cost involved. So what do we do? We find, we find the UCB of the reward and we find what is called the lower confidence bound for the cost. So it's again the mean cost minus a confidence radius. So we want to be optimistic, you know? So we hope that the cost, will have an optimistic estimate of the cost. So we combine the profit and the cost and that basically gives us the metric that we use to choose the action, okay? And so, okay, so here you go. So UCB is simply the you know, mean reward plus the confidence radius and the uh, LCB of the consumption is basically the mean consumption. You see, so each round you get this consumption value, right? And then you calculate the mean value and then you subtract this radius, confidence radius to get what's called the lower confidence bound. And then you will basically uh, compute this bank per buck, right? So algorithm is quite simple, okay? So first thing is, is unlike pure UCB, where you only consider a reward, but here you've got the cost as well. So we get to combine these two, right? Um, so, you calculate UCB of the reward and you get the LCB of the cost and you, uh, you compute this ratio, which is called the bank per bug. That's it. And then you rank all the actions based on this A value. The one with the highest value will be chosen in your next round. Okay. Yeah, uh, now this is not very important for me. So well, so this is basically the algorithm. Uh, Basically, you have got a budget, given a budget. So you initialize that new vector that you're going to use to update that uh, fictional unit cost. And then if you still have budget available, right? So you take action based on the highest value of bank per buck that you have computed, right? And what you observe is the reward and the cost, right? And if you still have budget available, you go to the next round. Right, so you have to compute the UCB again, you compute the LCB again, you compute the bank per buck again and choose the one with the highest value of bank per buck. It just goes like this until you have exhausted your resource. So simple algorithm. Okay, so uh, I will quickly show you some of the simulation results for this, uh, what is called uh, primal dual bandwidth, uh, sorry, uh, bandwidth with knapsack algorithm. Um, so we do uh, some simulations with, uh, you know, uh, 50 servers and say your uh, resource vector, resource consumption vector has a dimension of 10 and your resource budget for each of the resources is 500, but you can have different budgets for different resources, just for simplicity, you see the value here. And you have a number of uploading figures, 10,000. 
and the reward is Bernoulli distributed, resource consumption is beta distributed. Um, okay, so for benchmarking, uh, we use the optimal stochastic policy. This is the Gini aided algorithm, right? Where you know the expected reward and expected cost for each of the arms over uh, this uh, you know, uh, time horizon. Uh, there's the optimal uh, stochastic policy. Uh, and otherwise the best fixed server policy, again, say somehow you know the best server, right? Uh, the one that gives you the highest average reward. So every time you choose that server. So there's the second one. Of course, if you do that, you are not taking into account the energy, I mean, the resource constant. So basically intuitively that model is the best one, right? Pure UCB algorithm where you only take, about, uh, take the reward into account, but not the cost random selection and the round robin selection. So these are some of the benchmarks that uh, we compare uh, our algorithm with. Okay, so uh, on the left side, uh, you see a comparison in terms of the cumulative reward. And on the X axis, actually you see the time, uh, you know, values. So you see some of the, I don't mind, I don't know, my light is not blinking here. Sorry if I don't know. What's going on. The, the top the top I don't know what's going on. It doesn't work. So, well, anyway, so. Well, so, uh, so, you see, this is the optimal policy, the pink one, okay? And if you can see here, from this one, you need to see the reward that is generates 10,000. I'll do the quick thing for you. <laughs> so the reward that is generated is 1,000 times two, and the resource exhaust at like a 965 state. You know, at, you know, at that time point, the resource exhaust. So that's the best one, the optimal solar And this one here uh, is basically the uh, primary benefit uh, benefit. That's it, the algorithm that uh, I told you. And it produces even a higher reward, right? But it exhausts a little bit higher, like a 919. So at that time point, the resources are all gone. Okay. So then it can't use anymore. But uh, overall, it has got reward close, right? I mean, it's higher, actually, higher, like 1,039, and then it's 1,000. But look at the other one. The black one is basically the best fixed server. As I said, if you always choose the one, the best one, you know that okay, this action is the best. And in every slot you are taking that action, uh, you, uh, you uh, exhaust your resources very quickly. So basically the total reward is 540 and you, you finish at 533, right? Uh, and the other one, the UCB, this is the pure UCB, just slightly better. Uh, uh, it was doing well, you know, close to the, an optimal policy, but the resources ran out. You know, at what point? Uh, resources ran out about, you know, how much here, right? And these guys are the worst. Uh, so the green one is basically random, right? So produce uh, you are about uh, 900 and they exhaust, uh, uh, sorry, uh, they exhaust at 900 and the reverse are like 420 and 420. Okay, so, uh, uh, so basically the conclusion is uh, this primal dual, uh, thank you, primal dual uh, benefit abstract uh, algorithm are pretty good compared to the optimal stochastic algorithm. Now this is kind of a complementary to this uh, plot here where you show the, uh, you see the regress, so the regress at the uh, highest for these two guys, right? this uh, round robin, uh, and uh, random, right? So the highest we get. And you see here the light green one, which was the UCB one, was doing pretty good in terms of uh, the uh, regret, because as you see here, the difference is very small, right? And that is expected here, actually. So the regret is really small. However, it ran out of the resources quickly, right? While this 
primary uh, one, one, the twelve and uh, when up to uh, thousand five nine, you know, slot and then got the other forty six, which is much better than that. Okay. Uh, so good. I have got a few more uh, flat patch elements saying I said it, so it shows. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so um, the other plots here again, you know, the black one is for the best fixed server. Uh, as you can see, uh, basically it runs out of the resources uh, very quickly. So this runs out of the budget, you know, uh, first, right? So, and uh, basically the budget was 500 and you ran out of this budget around here, right? While this, uh, the optimal one, and the uh, uh, primal dual one, it ran basically longer, right? And this is uh, shows the energy consumption for the 10 different resources that I showed. So these are not probably that, uh, you know, interesting, but uh, the interesting plots are basically these two, okay? Yeah, I have to use both of them, okay. Now, again, uh, this just shows some uh, snapshots uh, for, uh, Results. So this is uh, optimal policy. We'll choose these servers, right? As you can see, these four servers are chosen most frequently, and the primal dual one will choose uh, these servers. This is for the round robin, as you can see. You know, it goes. Uh, everyone is chosen with equal kind of a probability, and this is the random selection. Okay. Now, uh, live. We have two minutes. Oh, yeah. Two minutes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So. Folks, so I will quickly uh, go through this contextual map. So as I was mentioning at the beginning, this is going to even higher level, okay? So far, we have not used any side information. The only information to be used is basically the reward that we have observed so far. Now this contextual bandits, they go even uh, to higher level where your decision uh, making process can exploit some time side information. Like in the context of this edge computing server, uh, you can probably have some information of the channel stage maybe that you transmit uh, through, maybe the server resources, maybe number of other users and things like that. So if you can export this information intuitively, you might be able to make a better decision. So this is the idea of uh, contextual bandits to export some more information. Now, again, the uh, Basis is actually the UC algorithm. So what do you do? Uh, you observe the rewards, right? That you have obtained for your uh, different action so far, right? Based on the different context. So each time you have a context, like it's, it's like the environment information that you have, right? And you choose an action and you get a reward. Right? So the next round, you have again a context. Now the problem is to make a decision, right? So from your historical data, right? From your historical data, you have to uh, find a mean value of the reward, right? This is like a, given a context, right? Given the historical information, right? The, what is the expected value of the reward if you choose action A? So this is a linear function of the current context. So this is called linear contextual bandit when you assume that your reward is going to be a linear function of your context, okay? Similarly, the cost for choosing action A given context X, and this is the historical information, your expected value of the cost is a linear function of the current context. So the problem here is obtain these guys here, uh, mu star and w star, this is a vector and this is a matrix. So basically due to the time limitation, I uh, can go through the details of uh, derivation of these two things. So basically the problem lies in finding out these two values. So for, each action, you get to find out this mu value and the W value. Now, this will give you what? This will give you the mean empirical reward and the mean cost. 
Remember in UCB, what you can do, you can find the mean and then find the confidence radius to find the UCB. For the cost, we find the LCB. Now this is the base, right? So after we know U, mu and W, we can find the mean reward and mean cost. You can go to the same process, finding the bank per bar, repeat the same thing. So this is what basically is the main concept of um, contextual bending. So uh, sorry for the time limitation, I cannot uh, go through the details, but uh, if you have any questions, you know, let me know or you know, I can, uh, uh, I'll be happy to share the slides, I think. So if you will share the slides, I think, right? So I have a, a bit more uh, discussion on this. Uh, you might uh, be able to go through them and if you have questions, let me know. So I'm going to wrap up here. Um, in summary, these multi unbended models are uh, important and useful tools for distributed decision making problems. And theoretically, they are uh, based, uh, stochastic optimization problems. So you are solving these stochastic optimization problems by kind of a machine learning technique, by doing some kind of reinforcement learning. So that's how you interpret uh, these models. Um, and they basically exploit, uh, I mean, use both exploration and exploitation. And the good thing is you are able to find regret bounds for many of these models. And generally the bounds do not depend on the number of arms. So in that sense, it's, it's good, right? So even though you've got many choices, many arms, the regret bounds are often function of time horizon in, in, in many cases. Uh, and there are, a number of different MEV models, and you know you might be able to choose from, uh, and, and you can fit your problem accordingly. Um, now, you might be able to exploit this algorithm along with some uh, offline learning models to even you know make uh, to come up with uh, novel methods for distributed control problems. Okay, thank you. So I would like to acknowledge. Uh, uh, help from my PhD student, Sharmila. So she has been working on this problem for some time. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm sorry for all this trouble. <laughs> so Ishi, we thank you very, very much for this uh, interesting presentation. Any question from the audience? Thanks. Thanks, Ekram. Very nice. Um, a more general issue. Typically, banded algorithms show a sort of assumption that you have a time independent conversion rate at hand. Um, maybe I have overlooked that argument, your generalization. Did you take a look at that? Does it still hold or not? I was not sure. Thank no, you. Actually, uh, as I said, the convergence bounds, I mean, is a function of this T, you know? Yeah. So I don't think it's independent of T, no. The bound depends on T, the time horizon. Which is a drawback in principle of banded algorithms, isn't it? Because you may not have that time independence in reality. No, because it's basically the time duration you play the algorithm. T denotes the time horizon. As you play longer, longer, so your regret uh, you know, is going to be basically uh, low. You know what I'm saying? Yes, I do, but but still, it's not really time independent. That's something. In some cases, it's not really helping. That's why this is a general issue of of concern. But discuss it offline. Thank you. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we can discuss. Yeah. Other questions? Any other question? So. Um... I have a. Sorry, do you mind? Yeah, come here. Yeah, please. Uh, okay. I'll be in the wire. Oh, so yeah. Again, Mike. Thank you, Ikram, for this nice presentation. Uh, I was wondering if there are any practical uh, problems in using uh, this kind of approach, uh, practically using it in real life. 
Yeah, like uh, as I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, you can use them for channel selection problem, you know, for distributed power control problem, you know, and as a base station association problem. Right now, when you say practical, they are very simple to implement, as you can see. The algorithms are really very simple, right? So, uh, but in reality, whether they are implemented in off the shelf, you know, devices, I'm not sure. But they are quite implementation friendly, as you see. They're not really complicated at all. So you can find many uh, applications where you have uh, the problem of selecting among multiple actions, right? Channels. If you have got discrete power levels to choose from, which level to choose, right? Which access point to associate with? So those kind of problems, which server to select, right? So discrete kind of selection, you see? So that your actions are kind of discrete here. You have a discrete set of actions to choose from, then you can use. And, and they're actually simple, I see. I mean, not complicated algorithm. Yeah. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Any other questions? So um, I have, uh, uh, yes. <laughs> so uh, I have a question regarding the, um, the uh, cyber security application of such kind of uh, methods, because when we speak about the rewards, etc., what happens, for instance, if they have the rewards that we give is, um, for instance, was that falsified by attackers, etc.? Is there any uh, search work regarding how to secure this uh, exchange of rewards, etc.? Okay, I think uh, for security. I mean, these are for, uh, as I said, if you put a discrete set of actions to choose from, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can fit into these points, right? So in security, uh, uh, Use the microphone, please, Ekra. Uh, if you have anything that involves, you know, uh, selecting among a discrete set of actions, I mean, you can use them. That's what I can, I can tell you. What, uh, I can't think of any specific security uh, problem probably at this moment, but might be, there might be uh, problems, but I have not seen actually uh, people using this for security of things. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Well, everybody is silent, maybe, you know. They're waiting for Yeah. But I mean, I can tell you maybe one comment. There have been a lot of theoretical works actually on this, but on the applied side, I don't think there are many you know, work there yet. So for engineers, I mean, this is a nice kind of a tool to use. That's what I, I can say. So uh, to leverage these models to many of the engineering type of problems. So this will be, I think, a nice uh, research you know, direction. Um, as I said, there are a lot of different kinds of these models. Now, if you can customize them for your uh, problem, I think they are nice contributions. Okay, so if there are PhD students here, I mean, if you're do doing machine learning type of thing, reinforcement learning stuff, then you can think of using these MAB models. Okay, they are uh, you know simpler than traditional, say, deep reinforcement learning or other models. So. As I can tell you, like these models gradually evolved to DRL models. You know, they are like a baby, baby kind of a, like contextual bandits. You can think of like a baby DRL models, you know. So they're simpler than uh, the conventional DRL type of models. Thank you. Okay, thank you very, very much. And uh, please uh, join me, Sharif, to uh, thank uh, Professor Ikram Hussain. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much.